Hello, may I introduce myself? I am NATO, the spirit of an alliance. My friends have come here to tell you the story of my life. My name, I repeat, is NATO. N-A-T-O, standing for North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Now your questions, one at a time, please. Would you mind sitting down, sir? You're getting in the way of the screen. Who are you? Just one of the 450 million people paying for you and your good old treaty? And there are one or two things I want to get straight for a start. For instance, who's in your alliance and why? I'll tell you. The North Atlantic Treaty, my friends, was signed on the 4th of April, 1949, by 12 free nations who banded together to protect themselves against communist aggression. 12 free nations. Belgium, Canada, Denmark, France, Iceland, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, the United Kingdom, and the United States of America. In 1952, Two more joined the family, Greece and Turkey. Then we were 14. And in 1955, in came the Federal Republic of Germany. So in our partnership, a brotherhood of 15 free and equal nations. In fact, I could say without fear of contradiction, we represent the greatest alliance for peace the world has ever known. Well, I'll contradict you for a start, brother. I'm sick of death of all alliances. Why don't you leave us in peace? If I get caught in a storm, that's my problem. Of course it's your problem, but what's wrong with putting up an umbrella? Surely you don't want to get soaked to the skin. Had there been an alliance of this kind in 1939, there would most probably have been no Second World War. Winston Churchill called it the unnecessary war. Let's try and learn something from history. Look what happened at the end of it. These peoples wanted peace and freedom, didn't they? But they stood alone, and where are they now? Gobbled up, all of them. Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, East Poland, parts of Finland, and East Prussia. Individually, they were helpless. Collectively, it might have been quite a different story. Even that wasn't enough. Next came the suppression of another group of free countries. Albania, Bulgaria, Hungary, Poland, Romania, and East Germany, a further 90 million souls were then shoved behind bars by the communists. All other political parties were dissolved, and their leaders liquidated. Then in March 1948 came the turn of Czechoslovakia. Jan Masaryk's death blew out the last lamp of freedom and truth in Eastern Europe. But that wasn't enough. All over the world, from Greece to Korea, from Turkey to Indochina, Wherever trouble was breaking out, Moscow had a finger in the pie. After World War II, the Western powers demobilized their armies, navies, and air forces. But Soviet Russia still kept five million men under arms. Then the claw reached out too far. In August 1948, Russia decided, on a trivial pretext, to block all roads to Berlin and to starve the city to submission. But this time, the West stood firm. Every available aircraft was rushed into service in a sudden act of triumphal cooperation, and West Berlin was saved. The countries of the free world realized that only together could they avert further danger. Nine months later, on the 4th of April, 1949, I was born. Looking back, I must have been a tough little baby. In less than no time, I bellowed out my first words. An attack on any one of us is an attack upon us all. Fighting words for a babe in arms, but it didn't take me long to realize that words alone were of little value in the strange, rough world in which I found myself. Actions shouted louder. So, as quickly as possible, we set about mending our fences. They hadn't been touched for years, and there was a vast amount to do. The North Atlantic Treaty recognizes a simple fact. An alliance for the defense of the West is of no value unless it has teeth. So between us, we made some teeth. Teeth like these harm no one unless trespassing. They come too close. Like NATO, they're purely defensive. 
They serve to make any potential aggressor think twice before attacking any one of us. Right? Any question? No. Then I'll read from the opening paragraph of the treaty. We desire to live in peace with all peoples and governments. We are determined to safeguard the freedom, common heritage, the civilization of our peoples founded on the principles of democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. We seek to promote stability and well-being in the North Atlantic area. We are resolved to unite our efforts for collective defense and for the preservation of peace and security. Any questions? You bet there are. I admit it all sounds fine, but how on earth can 15 different nations unite their efforts? Too many cooks spoil the broth. Ah, yes, but many hands make lighter work, and we are 15 good companions. Believe me, it doesn't take long to learn to pull together when you find yourselves all in the same boat. Let me show you how NATO works. Let's compare the working of the human body to the working of NATO. First of all, you have to have a head. There it is, the brain of NATO, the North Atlantic Council. Each of the 15 member countries is represented, as in the case of the United States, either by their cabinet members or by special ambassadors. They meet as a rule once every week in Paris. They discuss all their common problems, political, military, economic, cultural. The chairman of the council is the secretary general. His international staff is like the bloodstream of the NATO body. They keep things moving. Drawn from all the NATO nations, once they take up their post, they become responsible to NATO alone. To make its decisions, the council needs assistance and advice. So the nervous system connects the brain to the nerve ends of NATO, the Council Committees. Just as on the Council, all member nations are represented on these committees. They study all sorts of specialized questions, from politics to pipelines, from production to cultural relations, from economics to civil defense. And now we come to my bulging muscles, the NATO Military Committee, composed of the Chiefs of Staff of the member nations or their representatives, it meets regularly to discuss the military problems of the Allies. Iceland is represented by a civilian, as she has no military forces. Under the Council, this committee is the highest military authority in NATO. The group of three in the forearm is the standing group in which France, the United Kingdom, and the United States are represented. Like the military committee, it sits in Washington, and is responsible for day-to-day -day directives to NATO commanders. At my fingertips are the NATO commands, the European commander with headquarters near Paris. SHAPE covers the whole area from the North Cape to North Africa and Turkey. The Atlantic commander, SACLANT, is responsible for the defense of the sea lanes between America and Europe with headquarters in Norfolk, Virginia. That's the first peacetime international military command ever to have its headquarters in the United States. Two channel commanders are in charge of the defense of the channel. My thumb points to the Canada United States Regional Planning Group, which works out plans for the defense of the North American continent. And mark my word, together they pack a pretty hefty punch. I noticed you haven't used the heart in your diagram. And got a heart, I suppose. It's like all these setups, paperwork, planning, a nice little intellectual exercise for y'all. All head and no heart. No, my friend, I haven't used the heart. And why not? Because you are the heart of NATO. You. And you. And you next to him. All of you. This is not something imposed on us by a dictator. It's something we're making work for ourselves. Its success depends not on what they do, on whether or not you put your hearts into it. And what am I supposed to put my heart into? You tell me what you've done, first of all. Well, let's just take three of our many achievements. First of all, we built up our defenses and our integrated command system. Here you see one of our NATO commands at work. British, French, American, German, Dutch soldiers work together just as well as with their national colleagues. Since NATO began, our armed forces have grown from four to five times stronger. But 
These men need all sorts of things if they are to operate efficiently. Communication systems, airfields, and so on. We call these fixed installations the infrastructure. Here in this field of infrastructure, NATO scored another success. When I was a boy, as you see from this map, I had hardly any airfields to my name. Less than 20 in 1950 for the whole of our defense system. But now, look at them. Today there are more than 150 of them. All these airfields reconstructed together under a common international plan. Each country paid its share no matter where the airfield was to be built. This is a photograph of a North Atlantic Council in session. And though you might not guess it, a quiet revolution is taking place. For the days of the old secret diplomacy evolved behind locked doors are gone. Here, in free discussion, representatives of the 15 different nations consult with one another on their major foreign policy decisions together. Well, you haven't wasted much time. You built up your integrated forces. You established 150 airfields. You laid your thousands of miles of landlines and submarine cables and fuel pipelines. And you're also coordinating your foreign policy. That's fine. But what I want to know is what are you defending? You, my friend, and you're right to get up and make a nuisance of yourself. <laughs> you don't know how lucky you are. You come in here and shout your head off and no one minds. But there are places not far from here as the jet bomber flies where you'd soon find yourself saying your last words. It is the cause of Western civilization itself we are defending. The respect of the individual, human dignity, freedom and justice for all. The right to perfect our way of life and to crown it with a final cries of quiet conscience. It's not enough just to teach our soldiers to fight side by side if we are attacked. We must also teach ourselves to live side by side. In NATO, we not only coordinate our defense, we're also learning to coordinate our policies. We must strike up together like members of an orchestra. Only if we keep our policies in tune can we live in harmony. Only if we avoid ear-splitting discords in our respective economies can we serenade peace and live in prosperity? It's a waste of time to join an orchestra when the only tune you're prepared to play is your own national music. Not bad, I get the point. I think I'm getting to like you and your ideas, and now I'm getting to know you. But just one more question. Has all your hard work had any effect so far? Well, first of all, peace has been preserved. The fearful Third World War has not broken out. This was and is the primary purpose of the North Atlantic Treaty. Our defenses are in order. If attacked, the Alliance can strike back, and the Russians know this. Soviet expansion westwards has been stopped. Not a square inch of territory in Europe has fallen under Soviet domination since the treaty was signed. The national economies of the member countries are on the whole stronger today than when the treaty was signed despite the vast amount of money and human effort that has been devoted to defense. So, there it is. I told you how all this began, what I'm trying to do, and how I'm trying to do it, but this is only the beginning. I'm setting up signposts for the long, hard road that lies ahead. There still remains a lot to be done. Will you do your best to see that my story, like all good stories, has a happy ending?